Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those on the West Coast um, and elsewhere. Um, we are going to get started in just a few minutes. We wanted to let you know that all of the um, slides from all four modules, including today's, are in um, the handouts pane for you, so they're available for download. So feel free to um, download those slides if you like um, and refresh yourselves on the modules that we've done in the past. We really do welcome any questions about any of the content that we've covered during this learning collaborative. So we'll be getting started in just a few minutes, um, and so hang tight. All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, welcome uh, back for those who have been able to join us for our previous three modules, and we're really excited and um, to kind of wrap up our learning collaborative today and, and reflect on all of the things that we've discussed throughout the month of June. So today is module four, leveraging resources to pursue partnership opportunities. Um, and we will be sort of collab collaborating together in some activities, but then also um, reflecting on what we've learned and then what we can do in the future to kind of um, take action on some of these uh, learning concepts. So we're going to not only use the question pod today for questions, but also, as we've done in the last couple of modules, we're going to use it um, for interaction. So we're going to encourage you to type in answers to um, activities in your uh, question pod as well. Um, so just make sure to have that handy. If you want to make it bigger than, um, than is currently kind of on your pane, you can actually click the little um, box and it has an arrow pointing up to the left and that'll actually expand the questions pod for you so that it has, it has um, nice and big on your screen. So we will keep Slack open for a couple weeks and, and continue to sort of monitor that for discussion. We'll also be posting um, in Slack with some of the resources that we talk about today, as well as the post test, which we will be sending out next week. Um, we really would encourage you to, to complete that post test. Um, your feedback is really valuable to us and helps us improve our learning content. So I um, want to get that post test in and get your feedback. So we'll share that and other resources in Slack as well. So today, like I said, is our final module. We're, um, we're thrilled that we were able to um, have some great guest speakers join us for modules one through three. Um, and as a faculty, we've really appreciated your um, continued um, attention and sort of um, engagement throughout those modules. And I actually just wanted to um, open it up to the faculty and, and kind of ask that we do a little bit of a recap for each of the modules that we um, that we conducted and then that'll kind of refresh us um, and hopefully we can spark some conversation for um, the end of the webinar. So Christine and Ariel, do you want to, oh wait, nope, that's not the right one. Saki, I think you're the one for module one. Can you, um, you want to start with a brief recap? Sure, thanks Emily. So um, the first module, we talked about some of the senior-focused health programs for public housing residents are provided by public housing primary care centers. And we discussed some of the examples um, from a qualitative research study that we did here at NCHPH um, that provided examples of the programs that are available um, that link seniors to social services and um, such as uh, the PACE program or uh, supportive housing, as well as um, the challenges and solutions to um, uh, engaging with seniors and encouraging them to, um, to come to health centers and to get their um, health services. And um, I, some of the recommendations that we said was, you know, really identifying the needs of your senior population. And I uh, wanted to mention that, you know, seniors aren't a homogenous group, that there are different needs for different ages within the senior population. The, the needs of a 65-year-old group are very different from, you know, the needs of a 95 and older. So thinking about the, your senior um, populations and what types of partnerships are most important for the services that they might need. And of course, um, paying attention to the different leveraging up, uh, funding opportunities through Medicare um, and Medicaid, as well as local um, um, funding sources and uh, training staff. Um, we also heard from 
uh, Alivio Medical Center, which is in Chicago, that provided um, senior housing and used a interesting private public partnership between the city and a nonprofit um, organization to provide their services. And um, again, the, the comments and the slides and the recordings are all available um, uh, if you click the link. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Saki. Um, so for Module 2, this is Emily from NNCC. Um, we talked about the various data resources that you might need to kind of get information about not only your patient population uh, and, you know, the unique needs within, like Saki said, the subsets of, you know, your elderly population or your pediatric population, for example, but, you know, what are some of the data sources that you can look, look at in your community to kind of assess, um, you know, who in the community may be um, be able to benefit from services, be able to benefit from partnerships that your health center engages with. Um, and then we heard from uh, NNCC's nurse training manager, Jillian, and who talked about, you know, how to map your medical neighborhood, how to identify um, the partners in your community who are really going to be the ones to, to help bring services to your patients where they are. Um, and we sort of did a, a brief activity where we talked about a case study with Mrs. Rivera, um, which we're actually going to revisit today, and I'll have the case study of again for us. But we were able to kind of take a look at um, a hypothetical patient and maybe you know some of her unique needs, and think about you know what are some of the services or what are some of the partners that we can engage to really um, to bring services to to this patient. So, uh, and then for module three, we turn it over to Ariel and Christine. Sure. So this is Ariel from NCECE. Uh, in Module 3, we sort of built off of um, Module 2 where potential partners were identified and then focusing on how we build and sustain those partnerships. So we focused on briefly some uh, best practices for nurturing, maintaining, evaluating partnerships, a lot of best practices in each area really focused on having open communication and really clear roles and expectations, especially in regards to evaluating of wanting to know um, what information stakeholders want to know um, and, and the purpose behind it. Um, certainly discuss some of the barriers to effective partnerships, and you guys were great in sharing some of your experiences. It can kind of be summed up in the three main categories of time, trust, and turf. Uh, we had a great example of a really effective partnership that, that seemed to have overcome any of those time, trust, or turf issues when we heard about uh, Peninsula volunteers and their partnership with the Rideshare Service Lift, which allowed uh, them to offer discounted rides to um, their older adult uh, visitors, either from their home to medical appointments or from Little House, uh, the senior center itself, to their appointments. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. So we had a kind of clear trajectory, you know, starting with some examples from the field um, that we can, you know, that we can look at and then thinking about, right, well, what partners are in our community or what partners can we identify if we just sort of take um, a look at one patient or one population and then, you know, finally um, looking at how to sustain those partnerships. So today we're going to kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive on some of those topics, um, answer some any remaining questions that you have, and hopefully leave a lot of time for um, discussion and dialogue. And we're actually hoping to unmute everybody um, hopefully at the end of this module so that, you know, we really can have a discussion um, and just really go through anything that you kind of want to bring up about your own organization, any um, anything you want to troubleshoot with your peer group or with us. Um, really appreciate having some time to do that towards the end. So today we already did uh, the first item on our agenda, which is recapping the learning objectives, mo learning collaborative modules that we have already done. Next, we're going to dive into an MOU activity. So um, in last the last module, Ariel talked about um, memorandum of un memoranda of understanding and and those sort of agreements that we can make with partners. So we're going to talk about uh, you know actually building one of those from scratch. Uh, and then Saki's going to walk us through some additional case studies and examples that we can use to, to get a better sense of um, those sustained partnerships. Uh, and she's also going to talk about some opportunities for collaboration. And then, again, we're really hoping to spend a lot of time today um, in discussion with you all, um, answering any remaining questions that you might have. 
So I wanted to bring up this case study again, Mrs. Rivera. So hopefully we um, remember this. I highlighted a couple of things in here um, I, that would I'm, be of help for us today. I'm sorry, if you don't mind me interrupting. I Are you um, advancing your slides? Because I only see the oh. learning collaborative. Yes, sorry about that. I had it paused there. <laughs> Thank you, Saki. Okay. Um, so let okay. me go back to the agenda so folks can see that. So um, like I said, here is sort of our agenda for today. Thanks for letting me know about that. So um, again, this is the case study that we had talked about in module two, and I wanted to bring it back today so that we can kind of walk through um, an, an activity together and see how that goes. So I wanted to bring up a couple things about this case for us to pay attention to. So we, we have highlighted Mrs. Rivera's age, um, the fact that she lives in public housing, the fact that she continues to need transportation help, um, the fact that you know um, she is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes but still needs um, assistance finding the types of foods that are recommended by, by her provider, and then again that she's an avid, avid churchgoer, so something that we know about her, um, her life and, and her values that we can actually use to, to really provide her meaningful care. So here I actually want to bring up a, um, a sort of memorandum of understanding activity for us to do together, and before um, we do that I actually have a poll for all of you. So I want you to, um, I want you to kind of answer this poll so that we can decide how to, oops, let me launch it again. I think I accidentally closed it. Oh no. Hold on just a second. Let me just relaunch the poll. Okay, guys, sorry about that. Um, so if you can just pick from the um, items on your screen, which of these organizations we should start uh, working with to build a memorandum of understanding for Mrs. Rivera? Um, none of these are the wrong answer, but we just want to pick one that is going to um, maybe be the most urgent or um, the most important for her to kind of begin that partnership journey. So go ahead and type into your question pod which of these organizations you'd like to kind of work with to, to build an MOU. Okay, so I have church for one, perfect. Okay, continue to type those in. Okay, great. Good, so we got some answers there. So let's go ahead and do the Area Agency on Aging. I think that will be a good one, especially because, um, you know, they might have experience doing some MOUs, um, and we can kind of hopefully get a sense from them um, what might be a good fit. So I'm going to bring up this um, activity for us. Can everyone see that? Saki and Christine and Ariel, let me know. Yep. Okay, great. So this is an activity that we, um, NNCC, sort of developed in, in concert with um, Arizona State University and the Center for Advancing Interprofessional Practice, Education, and Research. Um, and this is just a template. Um, it certainly is not, you know, um, what every MOU is going to look like, but it's just a template for some of the things that we might want to include. Um, 
And so first, we kind of get to the purpose. So why are we partnering? Um, and so going through this MOU um, template is a helpful way for us to just even get on the same page about some of the um, ideas and definitions and purpose that we want to um, share across our partnership. So here on the, um, on the worksheet, we have two um, example purposes. So these are pretty um, straightforward to provide optimal health care for patients in the community, provide a better framework for communication and safe transition access between primary, specialty, and community-based services. So those are pretty broad purposes that I think could fit into many different organizations. But we want to identify a purpose for this particular MOU. So if we're per we are partnering with an uh, agency on aging in the in the um, community, what is the purpose of our MOU going to be? So go ahead and take a couple minutes to um, type in your question box a, a, a purpose framed as a two statement. We would love to get some feedback and also um, Saki, Christine, and Ariel feel free to chime in as well. So again, thinking about this specific organization, if we're the health center providing Mrs. Rivera's primary care, how are we framing the purpose of our MOU with this um, agency on aging? Okay, we have a couple. Great, thank you, Barbara. So this is a great one. To facilitate individuals' consistent participation in health-enhancing activities. That is a great one. Health-enhancing activities. So if we're then framing this as the purpose for this partnership, then our kind of activities with the agency that we're partnering with are going to be around facilitating that. So how do we create programs or partnerships to facilitate um, that participation in those activities? That's great. Thank you. So the principles. We have, I, I think, here a variety of really great principles, and I'm going to um, zoom in a little bit for you guys to see this. So keeping in mind the purpose that Barbara gave us, to facilitate individuals' consistent participation in health-enhancing activities, what are some of the principles that we might want to highlight? And we can take them you know, from this list. I think that would be totally appropriate in this case. The ones that point come out um, you know, that stick out to me are those mutual respect is essential, um, focusing on the patient or member preferences, making sure that we're really patient-centered in our approach. So maybe something around that, um, either picking something, a principle from this list that we have here, or maybe coming up with one that's appropriate. So if we as a health center are partnering with an area um, agency on aging, what's one of the principles? Let's, let's just identify one principle that we think is going to be a really valuable um, principle. Go ahead and type those in if you'd like. I'll add that here. Okay, great. So we have one focused on patient and family needs. Perfect. Great. And so I think, you know, all of these principles I think are, are you know, obviously important to include in one way or another. But as, as we're thinking about being specific with this partnership and, and building an MOU that we can agree on and kind of reflect on, you know, selecting those principles that are, are most um, applicable to sort of what we're trying to create or maybe the program that we're doing together. So finally, or 
not finally, but there's other um, elements, but I kind of want to wrap up with this one. We have a common list of definitions that we want to include in the MOU because, you know, when we're talking from our health center perspective, often we might have definitions for um, team roles or diagnoses or um, things in, in the community that are different from the definitions used by our partners. So we want to have a common sort of set of definitions that we can, um, as partners, sort of refer to um, throughout uh, and make sure that we have some consistent language both within the partnership and for patients as well. So we have here a list of definitions that we can include. There's the primary care physician or provider, a specialist, um, patient member and support, so that's an activated patient, patient goals, and a medical neighborhood. But I actually am curious to hear from all of you what's missing from this um, definition list. So specifically if we're talking about Mrs. Rivera, her needs and partnering with this area agency on a aging, what is missing from this um, definition list that you think would be really helpful to include? So I'll give you a few minutes to just type those in. Okay, great. So we have patient history. So that's really, really helpful. Um, patient history for us at the health center might be their medical history um, since they've been with us as a patient or for the agency on aging, it might just be since they entered that agency at you know whatever age. But really, you know, we want to also consider the patient's experiences prior to you know them either becoming our patient or um, joining that agency um, to maybe have some relevant information there. So that's great. Thank you. Can we get one more? What's missing here? I might add, just for my own sake, um, how does the health center define it versus how does the um, agency on aging define it? Are there brackets within that population, like Saki said, that you know fall into different categories? Um, you know, how, can we get on the same page about the population that we're serving? Okay, great. So I'm not going to go through this whole document, but I just sort of want to um, use this as, a, as an example to sort of build, um, you know, keeping in mind the partner that we're working with and the purpose of our, um, our partnership, building from there uh, a memorandum of understanding that really um, like codifies that relationship and, and sort of gives us a common place to sort of connect about, you know, why are we partnering and how do we continue to partner? Um, so we, you know, this document also goes through the different types of care that we can um, offer a patient. How are we going to measure performance of this partnership particularly? Um, who else can we look to for um, support and facilitation? And then sort of the, the nitty gritty of, you know, what are the, um, the items or documents that we're sharing? How can we um, continue making sure those lines of communications are communication are open. So I'll share this um, document with you. We'll make a couple of tweaks to it, but I'll share this with you as an example in case you're not um, familiar with building memorandum of understanding and it would be helpful, you know, for you maybe as a staff to look through this and, and sort of think about, you know, how can we build these for some of our current partners. I also want to just briefly before we um, turn it over to Saki, um, the CDC has this sample memorandum of understanding on their website that you can sort of um, download and use. I'll also make this available in Slack for you. Um, and so they frame it in a slightly different way, but in a way that you can see still in includes some in common information that would be helpful for both parties to understand. They also um, include funding and duration, which I think are really critical. Um, Saki, in her case study uh, and a case example, is going to go through some of those um, funding mechanisms that were used to support those partnerships, but really important to keep in mind that even though we might have a source of funding that, you know, 
start the partnership? How are we going to make sure that that continues, even though you know a, fun, a source of funding might go away or the situation changes in some way? Um, so keeping in there um, some contingencies for that is really important and helpful. So I'll make sure that I share both the CDC document with you and the um, facilitation guide that we have so that you can sort of use that amongst your staff. But now I'm actually going to turn it over to Saki, and I'm going to make her the presenter um, so that she can share some of her um, key studies with us. So, Saki, you should have control now if you want to share your slides. Oh, like we're seeing the um, presenter mode there. There we go. Okay, are you seeing the slide now? Yeah, looks good. Thanks. Okay, great. All right, thanks. So, thanks, Emily. Um, and as she, as Emily mentioned, um, I wanted to highlight just a couple of examples of partnerships that took advantage of the multiple funding streams that are in their cities to provide services to public housing residents. And the first um, example is in Chicago. Um, and it's with TCA Health, um, which is a health center that had experienced challenges reaching out to their public housing residents in their service area. So many of the public housing residents were underutilizing the health, such as health services that were available at the, at the health center and just ended up visiting the clinic only when there was a medical emergency. So TCA contacted the Chicago Housing Authority to find ways to educate public housing residents about obtaining healthcare coverage and um, about educating them on the preventive services that were available at the health center. And CHA was an ideal partner because they immediately saw the value of the partnership. And the CDHA director said, you know, part of our mission is to support stability and quality of life. And what's more important to that than health? So they worked together to apply for and receive a grant, and this was funding through the ACA that was available a couple of years ago. And with those shared resources, they were able to hire and train two public housing residents to conduct outreach and enrollment activities. So TCA worked with the property managers at the housing authority to enroll public housing residents into health insurance when they came in to pay for their rent um, at the laundromat. Um, at local advisory council meetings and at other events that were hosted by the housing authority. And together, the organizations were really able to maximize the opportunities to reach residents. Um, they were able to enroll more than 1,000 individuals into Medicare or Medicaid, and more than 3,000 received one-on-one -on -one health education training. Um, and what made this partnership successful was having a resident champion to promote the initiative to other residents and also just an ongoing commitment to communicate between the organizations through regularly scheduled meetings and to ensure that there was shared knowledge between the organizations. Um, another benefit of the partnership was the ability to collaborate with additional stakeholders. Um, so the two organizations planned and formed working groups with 25 other organizations um, to identify and address the, the various issues that were facing the residents. And with more partners at the table, they were better positioned to identify the key issues um, and then that they were facing and then accessing the health and social services that were available, um, which then informed their programmatic goals. So the original collaboration led to a gradual increase in the number of health-related initiatives in public housing, including fitness programs, cooking classes, community gardening projects, food accessibility initiatives, community health education workshops, and then access to mobile healthcare services. Um, and then the next example that I'm going to provide is in Flint, Michigan, which is an area that has been hit particularly hard by the opioid epidemic. And as a result, um, drug-related violence has been a big problem in the community. And now they have several programs that have helped rates of crime and violence decrease in the city. And one of those is addressing um, the substance abuse problems in the area. So they have established drug courts, mental health courts, and veterans courts. Um, they've all been put in place to address the underlying issues of violence in the community. And in this particular partnership, 
a Genesee Health System staff member is embedded in the drug court and the mental health court. So the drug courts and mental health courts are, are um, provided through uh, funding through the Department of Justice, and they have supplemental grant funding that they use to share the health center staff. So every day, the staff member reviews and screens the police reports, and they cross-reference those reports with a patient list from the health center. Um, and that's through a consensus, uh, they ad obtain consensus, or sorry, um, they obtain, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Um, they, they permission to use that information or to get that information. Um, so individuals that have been arrested that also suffer from mental health illnesses are put into an expedited hearing process. And the arresting officer or the sheriff, prison staff, prosecuting attorney, and the judge are all notified and they discuss the case in a closed door pre-court meeting so that the personal details can remain confidential. Um, so an expediting hearing is set with the immediate bail if the individual agrees to get treatment at the health center or if they are enrolled in a program to complete mental health or substance abuse services. And then the charges are dropped and wiped from their record if they complete their treatment program. So there are two really good outcomes of this um, system. The first is that it allows individuals to get out of jail quicker, and the second into um, appropriate services faster than the normal criminal justice, justice system. And there was a study conducted by Michigan State University um, that showed a reduced rate of recidivism and which resulted in savings across many agencies. Um, so I know that the focus of this learning collaborative has prim primarily been on seniors, but I wanted to draw your attention to this case example because, I mean, first it, I mean, addressing violence and substance abuse benefits the community at large, right? Creating safer neighborhoods for everyone, um, including seniors, but it also by highlighting the diverse group of community partners that can improve health, um, in addition to health agencies and housing organizations. Um, so uh, I wanted to, to talk about two opportunities for collaboration and there's this one polling question that we have. So there are two HUD policies, I think, that provide an opportunity for collaboration that I just wanted to mention briefly. And the first is a rule that requires all public housing buildings to implement a smoke-free policy. And I'm, I'm sure that most of you all are aware of this policy. And if we could just um, do the poll. Um, okay, yeah, so it looks like the poll is open. Uh, and I just wanted to know how many of you all are um, collaborating with your local housing authority to deliver smoking cessation services to public housing residents. So this, in case you aren't familiar, this policy went into effect last fall in August of last year. And so now all public housing re um, developments are required to be smoke free. Um, and I, I can't see the poll, so I don't know if yeah. Yeah, it looks like we have a little under half who participate. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple minutes to answer that. Okay, great. And I'll share the results once we have a couple more answers. And um, this is just a, a good opportunity to work together. I don't know if you're familiar, but the smoking rate for public housing residents is around 33% compared to the national aver average of 22%. So given this new smoke-free policy, there's an, there might be an incre increased interest and need for smoking cessation services at local health centers. Absolutely. All right, great. I'm going to go ahead and share those results. So it looks like most most said no. There were some I don't know answers as well, and then um, just a couple of yeses. So um, maybe some room for exploring um, exploring that partnership, Saki. Great. So um, so here are some examples that health centers um, or health agencies can do to collaborate with our housing authority on this specific issue. And this is kind of a generic slide, but we can talk through um, what it means for smoking cessation. And then the first is, um, you know, they could, uh, the health center could provide information about the services, the, you know, the primary and behavioral health services that are offered at the health center. During the time of lease signing, um, staff could also meet with resident advisory boards to understand the needs of the community. Um, they could provide health education materials at 
the um, at the public housing site. We've heard about partnerships that involve using um, the space that's available at the public housing authority to provide health education and nutrition classes, for example, or exercise classes. Um, or they can uh, provide, offer additional support to residents, um, in this case, that may have created um, a, a violation of their lease by being caught smoking. And so certainly with this new policy, one of the, um, the issues that you worry about is uh, people getting kicked out of public housing if, if they violate this rule. And, and no one wants that. So it's possible to for health centers to work with the housing authority to um, uh, for for residents that have violated the policy to um, get specific uh, services at the health center as part of um, of that pro of their process for um, uh, you know what they do when someone violates any sort of, sort of policy at the at the housing development. So those are just some opportunities for that specific issue. And then there's another um, initiative from HUD that uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with. It's called HUD Envision Centers. And uh, Sen Secretary Carson has talked about this several times um, during his uh, tenure as the secretary of, at HUD. And it's essentially a program to improve self-sufficiency, and they're partnering with other organizations on issues related to the economic empowerment, um, educational advancement, uh, character and leadership, but also health and wellness. And there's three specific goals that are outlined in the initiative um, that are relevant to FQHCs. And the first is to increase prenatal visits, to increase um, adult annual physicals, and also hearing and vision screening for children. Um, and so since these are parallel to the goals for health centers and health departments, it's fitting to work together to achieve those goals. And so, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, part of what um, Ariel outlined in the previous module, as well as um, Emily, about establishing, um, you know, shared goals and values and, uh, you know, uh, different opportunities to work together, it seems like this is a, a good opportunity um, for health centers to reach out to the housing authorities because this is also um, a very important goal from, from Senator uh, Secretary Carson's point of view. And you can go online to see this is a, um, it is a demonstration project now. There are 17 sites, um, but I think it will grow um, because it does have the political support to do so. And so those are just two different um, examples that I wanted to let you all know about um, as you all are thinking through collaborations in your community. And that's all I have, Emily. Great. Thanks, Saki. I just shared the Envision Center link with all of you. Um, I think it really does um, provide a concrete kind of um, outline for a potential partnership that um, specifically, you know, HUD has, and HUD and um, HRSA, uh, in, ter in terms of health, the health center program, have looked to, um, to maybe implement. So we want to actually leave this time for final questions, and we really do want to encourage you to ask questions about any of the topics that we discuss during, um, you know, our, our four-part series here in this Learning Collaborative. And as you guys are getting ready to type in your questions, which I'm sure will be many questions, uh, we would love to entertain those. We actually do want to um, talk a little bit, you know, just as faculty um, about that funding question. So. You know, um, even some of these projects that are coming out of HUD and, and the federal, federal government, you know, they might make suggestions about partnerships and, and might encourage partnerships, which I think HRSA often does. But, you know, a, a lot of the time, I think we struggle to find the funding to support a new initiative or a new project. So, and, and funding, of course, is only one of the, the elements. We also uh, have some hard time identifying time as health center staff um, to engage in these partnerships and then who at the health center will really be the champion for these partnerships. So I just want to put it out there and maybe have um, the faculty weigh in about um, some lessons learned around funding. I know that um, I think Saki might have mentioned this in one of her um, case studies in the first module uh, and then maybe Ariel did as well but you know 
in lieu of funding, you might be able to find either a housing authority or another agency that has space to donate um, in kind support. So um, if you have staff who are able to provide services on site for patients in the community, um, you know, but don't have necessarily the funding to select a new site, um, you know, utilizing your partner's existing, you know, free space might be a good solution there. But I want to open it up to Saki um, and Ariel and Christine to kind of get some more perspective about that funding question and resource allocation question. Meanwhile, please type in your questions to us, and then hopefully um, in a couple minutes we can unmute everyone as well. I don't know, Saki or Christine or Ariel, if you want to anyone wants to go first and just sort of have that a larger discussion about where to look for um, funding to continue to sustain some of these partnerships. So uh, this is Christine. Thank you so much, Emily and, and Saki, for uh, sharing all of the wonderful information today. Um, I, I think that uh, in terms of the, the financial considerations and um, thinking about particularly the MOU exercise or activity that you have walked us through, uh, as we all know, um, funding uh, either programs or uh, launching um, uh, pilots can be difficult in terms of the financial aspect. And um, sometimes, uh, in working with with partners, um, because a, a lot of us function in the uh, nonprofit space, um, where funding is is definitely tight or um, or is earmarked marked for very specific things, um, sometimes actually bringing a third party in who has the same uh, uh, primary purpose or, or, or mission can be helpful, particularly foundations. And I know that we've all been in the place where we've had to write foundation grants to, uh, to fund either special projects or things that um, we've been interested in uh, bringing into our programs that might be a little bit different than, um, than what we typically might do or, or uh, is uh, an activity that not many people are doing and um, we really feel it's in the best interest of our, our patient population. And I think that in some of the resources that we shared last week about sort of maintaining partnership, it was definitely identified throughout that funding is a challenge and to diversify as much as possible. I really do like what you just said, Emily. Um, about seeing perhaps what other contributions people can make to a partnership uh, because depending on the type of service that you're providing, it could be that there doesn't have to be a large exchange of money, but instead kind of really coming to a clear open agreement on what you're each able to contribute. And yeah, if there's more people contributing, even small amounts, there's a greater likelihood of that, um, of that partnership being able to be sustained over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to, as you were talking, um, Christine and Ariel, especially, I wanted to just bring up grants.gov, which I, I'm sure that, you know, um, that you all are aware of and familiar with. You can set up um, email alerts with grants.gov to kind of think about, you know, the funding areas. I, I typed in seniors, um, for example, for a keyword here, but you can set up alerts to come to your email, um, you know, whenever opportunities that match this the criteria that you put in do come up, they can just be sent right to you. Now, a lot of these federal grants are going to be for larger projects and maybe, you know, are pretty resource intensive to, to go for, so maybe not the best fit. Um, I also just wanted to bring up Foundation Directory Online, and this is just strictly, um, you know, grant funding, um, which, you know, obviously I think it's not taking into consideration that in kind or you know donations or things like that, but um, if you do have access to Foundation Directory Online, you no, know, it's a it's actually a pretty reasonable um, cost in terms of like a license to use the software, and it's a it's actually a very I think helpful software um, even as a as a health center. If you're thinking about partnering with another organization, think about well what what type of funding does that organization have access to in the what what has that organization have, have access to in the past? You know what are some of the area the foundations that um, do 
fund projects in our area. So for example, you can kind of find funding um, in foundations based on you know your population served, some of your subject area, maybe your geographic focus. So I am in Philadelphia, so maybe Philadelphia County searching for these um, these foundations. And so then you can see there's 155 grant makers, which kind of gives us um, the various foundations that might fund some of the projects that we're thinking about. And this is, again, you know, it's not a free resource um, in terms of doing a deep dive, but if you do um, find that either your um, development person or, you know, the, the health center staff who is responsible for maybe looking for some of these, if this is a helpful resource, um, it can be nice to just get a sense of who in the community is, is actually funding this work. And maybe could they, could they at least provide some startup funds, you know, to get some of this, um, to get some of these new projects off the ground. Saki, anything um, that you wanted to add to that? No, I think you all have it covered. Um, does anyone enter anything in the chat? Not quite yet, but I would love either A, some questions, or B, some um, specific um, things that you found if, as you're trying to look for funding or resources um, in terms of the partnerships that you want to pursue. Anything that's been a challenge to you, or um, alternatively, any lessons learned or, or some you know, best practices that you've discovered along the way. Would love for you guys to enter those into the question pod so we can kind of talk about that. And I'm going to go ahead and share Foundation Directory Online. I'm going to share this link with you all in case you want to take a look at it um, for your own use at your health center or organization. One question it looks like um, came through Christine and, well, I guess the whole group, the whole faculty can look at this. Um, when you're sort of partnering with an organization and, you know, decided that this is going to be a good thing for, you know, your patients, um, you know, bringing services to them, what is a good way, it seems, to let your patients know that this partnership is happening and then, you know, make them aware that these services are now available? I wonder if um, and either any faculty member could maybe speak to that a little bit. Hi, Emily. That's a great question. This is Christine. I think that um, uh, putting uh, information out uh, across the health center is is uh, is certainly one step. Um, depending on what the service is, uh, it might be more feasible as well as um, it, uh, I guess more feasible. Um, to uh, provide the information to whatever service this uh, support service is, is connected with. So, um, uh, so if it's something that directly connects to, for example, people with diabetes, then there might be something in the in the chart on the EHR that alerts uh, healthcare providers. Uh, for their patients with diabetes that, hey, they should let them know that there's, uh, that this partnership has been established and that these patients have, uh, the patients with diabetes have access to these additional services. Um, also, I think in terms of working with uh, health center, uh, social service, uh, the social service or social um, and support individuals like social workers and and then even uh, globally to let uh, anyone who's checking a patient in um, know about these services and either uh, relate the information to them when they're at the, the receptionist desk or the check-in desk or to have a sign available that is um, uh, very easily seen and read by um, any of the individuals in the health center. 
And I would just That's add a point, uh, for an echo, um, yeah, what Christine had just said. You know, you think about your, your current outreach channels, uh, communication channels that you have um, available at the health center, or the signage that you have, the, the, um, the case management um, that you have at the health center, and also, as um, Christine mentioned, using utilizing your um, uh, patient engagement um, uh, services through your EHRs um, and text messaging and through patient portals to, to get um, that information out, um, as well as um, uh, taking advantage of whoever your partners are in their communication channels. And another opportunity is to discuss to do services with discharge staff at the hospitals who are trying to um, release patients. Sometimes they're not aware of all of the different services that you offer. Um, and so that's just another uh, place to go and create a, a partnership with them so that uh, you guys are, they're aware of all of the, the types of services that you're providing. Absolutely. Great. And that, I think that, that this answers really speak to that sort of continuity of care question that we're often asked a lot. You know, um, how do we know what a patient, you know, when a patient's been discharged from a hospital, for example? How do we know what they, you know, what services they're accessing and how can we tap into that? So um, I think, you know, it, it just sort of speaks to letting your partners or the, the or at least the, the service providers that your patients are seeing know, you know, hey, we're out here and, and this is something that we can provide um, and maybe even, you know, gain some additional patients and identify some folks who may, may be um, in need of services who aren't receiving those yet. So, great. So that seems like the only question that's come in so far. Um, we obviously want to encourage folks, you know, feel free to reach out to any of the faculty members um, really anytime. You know, it doesn't have to end here, certainly, um, after this module today. Feel free to reach out to us um, with any questions you might have uh, regarding any of these topics that we've discussed. Again, all of the slides are there for you um, in the handouts pane here on the, on the module. But I will be um, sending out not only the recording and slides from today, but a really important post-test that we would really love for you guys to, to complete for us. So the post-test really lets us know um, what worked, what didn't work, and maybe some future topics that would be helpful to you. Um, so we really appreciate your, your feedback on that. I'll be able to send that out um, sometime next week for you all. But I just want to, before we wrap up, give uh, our faculty a chance to, to say any final words or final thoughts for our um, attendees. I'd just like to thank everyone for hanging in there and participating in all mm -hmm. this collaborative. We really appreciated your participation, and we've really enjoyed um, creating these uh, uh, webinars uh, presentations and and that um, you know inviting um, other panelists to discuss all of the important things and work that they're doing. So thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to to do this. And I've learned a lot um, by participating, and I hope uh, you all have as well. And I'll just uh, e uh, echo exactly what uh, Saki said. It's always uh, really nice to be able to. Uh, to work with you during these these collaboratives and um, and hopefully whether uh, you take the information away and use it immediately or um, or in uh, in the future um, we hope that it's been helpful and certainly as Emily has said if you have any lingering questions or come across something that uh, you would like to think through, we certainly would be happy to uh, to work with you and, and answer any questions or find resources um, that you might need. So thank you so much again for, yeah. for participating and, and taking the time out of uh, your very busy days. Yeah, that's critically important. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And we know it is a lot to, um, to ask to take that time and, and really do appreciate that. Um, also, just wanted to let you know that next year, so and by next year I mean in a month, <laughs> in July, um, the Social Determinants of Health Academy will be putting out some additional resources. Um, we're going to be doing some more um, learning collaborative type activities, maybe not exactly this one, but um, definitely some more activities around the social determinants of health and how we can you know, meaningfully and, and thoughtfully incorporate that into our health center practice. So. Uh, be on the lookout for additional sort of SDOH Academy um, 
uh, information and trainings as they come up in the next couple of months. But again, I just echo Saki, Christine, and Ariel. Thank you guys so much for continuing to um, engage with us throughout the month of June. We really hope you enjoy the rest of your summer, and please feel free to keep in touch. Thanks so much, everyone.